Hello and welcome to the first of our epistemology lectures. So first of all, what is epistemology? Well, epistemology refers to the theory of knowledge. It explores different ideas and questions pertaining to knowledge. We're going to break epistemology up into five main sections and we're going to start today with what is knowledge and how is knowledge to be defined. But the other bits that we will move on to are theories of perception, in which we ask what we can learn through our sense perception, such as sight and touch. We then explore innatism versus empiricism. This is the idea from innatists, some rationalist philosophers, that when we're born, we already have some kind of knowledge. This is very much going against the empiricist view that when we're born, we are blank slates or tabula rasas. We then look at knowledge through reason and we take a very close look at the idea that we can come to knowledge just by thinking, just by reflecting on ideas in our own minds. Descartes, a rationalist philosopher, is the main focus here. And he claims that we can come to certain knowledge, knowledge we cannot doubt, just by thinking. Again, we have a battle between this rationalist view and the idea given to us by empiricists, that we don't come to knowledge through that way, but only through experience. And then our final section is scepticism, or the limits of knowledge. And we bring together a lot of the strands that we will have looked at throughout and ask the question of whether we can ever really know anything for certain. So let's make a start with looking at that first section. What is knowledge? And first of all, let's think about how we should be defining knowledge. Well, after a quick think, it soon becomes clear that actually knowledge is not just of one kind. There are actually three different types of knowledge. So I have practical or ability knowledge. For example, I know how to ride a bike. This is knowing how. I then have acquaintance knowledge. For example, I know Billy. I'm acquainted with Billy and I know Dorset. This is knowing of something or someone. And then finally, I have propositional knowledge. For example, I know that my front door is yellow and I know that London has a large, large population. This is knowing that. And it's this kind of knowledge that we focus in on for this unit. This last type of knowledge, propositional knowledge, could also be known as factual knowledge. Now, it's called propositional because it can be expressed in terms of propositions. And a proposition is a sentence that makes a claim about the world. Something like, I have ten toes and I like cheese. And this kind of knowledge can be expressed through language whereas maybe the other two can't. So how should knowledge be defined? Well, let's have a look at the work of Linda Zagzebski because she is on your anthology and you should be aware of her ideas here. Linda Zagzebski makes it clearer about what we mean by defining things. And she says, well, some things, they have a real essence in that they can be defined by what they consist of, by their properties. For example, water can be broken down into H2O. That's exactly what it is. So it can have a real essence because it's made up by certain real things. On the other hand, there are things that have a nominal essence. Now these that are things that cannot be defined or broken down or simplified into properties, as its meaning is not within it or what it's made up from, but 
its meaning is found outside of it. Just think for a moment about weeds. What are weeds? Are there specific types of plant that everyone would define as weeds? Is there something intrinsic in itself in this plant that makes it a weed? No, not really. The meaning that we that we, weeds have is given by people and how they classify the definition of this thing. So this meaning is found outside of the weed, not inside of it. So it cannot have a fixed definition. Now, Linda Zagzebski thinks that we should really be hunting for the real essence of knowledge. She really wants to nail exactly what, what knowledge is, but she does suspect that knowledge might only have a nominal essence because our understanding of knowledge has really changed as time has gone on. But look down the bottom here. This is more advice from Linda Zagzebski and she tells us of things to avoid in the search for knowledge and what we shouldn't do when trying to define knowledge. Well, first of all, we shouldn't give a circular definition. So to say things like, well, knowledge is when we know that something because you're just going round and round in circles. Also, it shouldn't be obscure. So we shouldn't come up with some definition that is really unhelpful because nobody really understands it. Also, it shouldn't be negative. So we shouldn't say, well, knowledge isn't or is not a belief. So trying to define it in the negative, again, is not helpful. And also, and this one is really important for later in the course, it shouldn't be ad hoc. We shouldn't keep changing our definition to fit in with the problems that we might have. So it shouldn't be changed to fit with certain circumstances and situations. Have a look at two really important ideas that help us to work out whether we've got a good definition of something. We can look at necessary and sufficient conditions. We can look if something has elements it cannot do without. In other words, it's necessary conditions. Let's look at the conditions of being a bachelor. Here we're saying that John is a bachelor. So what does that mean? Well, it means that John is unmarried. Yes, bachelor has the property of being unmarried. It is a necessary condition of being a bachelor. What about John having brown hair? Is this a necessary requirement of John being a bachelor? No. John could have any colour hair or no hair at all and still be a bachelor. So this is not a necessary condition. Can you see that one way of checking for something's necessary conditions is if you swap them around and it still makes sense. The one is defining the other the other way round. So we've got John is unmarried. So therefore John is a bachelor and we've still got this thing making sense. Let's have a go with triangles. That is a triangle. What are the necessary conditions of a triangle? Well, a triangle is a shape and it has three sides. If it had four sides or five sides, then it wouldn't be a triangle. So it's a necessary condition to have three sides. Let's do our test. It is a shape. It has, has three sides. Therefore, it is a triangle. We have our necessary conditions. Let's now consider the idea of sufficient conditions. This refers to a complete definition, whether you have all the necessary conditions to have a complete definition of that thing. Look again at John the bachelor. 
We know that being unmarried is a necessary condition for John being a bachelor. But is it sufficient for him to be a bachelor? No. Another necessary condition is that John needs to be male. If John was female and unmarried, he would not be a bachelor. He would be a spinster. So here we had an example of a necessary condition for being a bachelor, being unmarried, but it wasn't enough to be a sufficient definition. We needed to add another necessary condition. John is male, John is unmarried, therefore John is a bachelor. Let's look closely at the difference between necessary and sufficient conditions and start to apply this thinking about defining what knowledge is. We are asking two very different questions about how to define things. Number one, what are the essential elements of A or something? What can A or something not do without? And that's asking about the necessary conditions. And number two, to define A fully, have we included all the elements we need to? So this is asking about the sufficient conditions. Now applying this to knowledge then, number one, what necessary conditions does knowledge need to be knowledge? Now, many people for many years said that knowledge was something called JTB and we're going to be looking at this in a great deal of detail over the next few weeks. Knowledge equals justified true belief. Are they the necessary conditions? And then secondly, we're going to be asking whether if we have justified true belief, is that enough to define knowledge? Is it sufficient? So let's make this clear with our definitions on the right hand side. A necessary condition is a condition required by a definition that the thing cannot do without. And the sufficient condition is an assessment of whether the conditions identified are enough to define a thing fully. Traditionally, and up to very recently, the 1960s in fact, which is incredibly recent in the world of philosophy, knowledge has been defined in terms of three necessary conditions. And this is called the tripartite view of knowledge. And it goes as follows. Knowledge is JTB. To know P, to know a proposition, then the proposition P is true. Secondly, you believe in that proposition P. And finally, your belief in that thing, that P, is justified. So we have got knowledge as justified true belief. For me to know P, for example, there is a llama in my garden. There must actually be a llama in my garden. It must be true. I believe there is a llama in my garden. And I believe this because I can see it. It's justified. I can see it eating my grass. I have a justified true belief, therefore I have knowledge, I know that there is a llama in my garden. So in summary today, we've looked at the different types of knowledge. We've defined three different types. We've looked at how knowledge is to be defined and analysed with the help of Linda Zagzebski. We've looked at the difference between necessary and sufficient conditions for knowledge and how that helps to define a concept. And finally, we've explored the tripartite view of knowledge, that knowledge is a justified true belief.